conversation tonight. It's 6 p.m. in LA, uh, but we have guests in this conversation from um, all over the place. So we're really excited to host this conversation as part of uh, as part as of ReFest, Culture Hub's annual festival, bringing together artists, technologists, and activists. So um, we will start by kind of introducing the two organizations that came together to um, host uh, this conversation. So Culture Hub um, is a global art and technology community with locations in uh, Los Angeles, New York, Korea, Indonesia, and Italy. Um, we're founded by um, La Mama and Soul Arts, and we um, provide connected environments for artists to examine evolving uh, relationships to technology, um, intersections of art and technology, and all of beyond. So, um, like I mentioned, this conversation is being hosted as part of ReFest. Um, this year, ReFest LA is taking place entirely online. Um, with virtual experiences, remote workshops, um, online performances, and conversations like this um, surrounding the theme regeneration. So check out the full lineup of ReFest at cultureup.org. And um, I hope you'll join us for some of the programming that we have for rest of June. Um, so Rochelle, would you like to introduce Super Collider? Sure thing. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm going to just hop in and share my screen to show you a little bit about Super Collider. So Super Collider was uh, founded in 2018, and it is comprised of two parts. Um, we have a mothership headquarters, which is a science art gallery space here in Los Angeles. And then we also expand to do satellite exhibitions and programs, uh, whether that's an international gallery exchange, uh, curations and museum spaces and art fairs. Our mission is really to expand science, art and technology based projects um, into new spaces. Um, and we also have an emphasis on space as a platform to explore and expand our creations. So just kind of a glimpse at um, the mothership space. Um, if ever you're in Los Angeles, definitely reach out to us. Uh, we have a range of artists represented in this panel that have participated in our exhibitions and are highly involved in our programming as SciArt ambassadors. And um, have, they've also contributed to guest talks and things. So we show anything from VR to um, large scale interlaced interactive installations, video, and performance. Um, so this is a glimpse at uh, the mothership space um, that also sometimes expands into this other area. Um, we also have a lot of living matter, so also working in the realm of bio art. And then kind of a glimpse at some of our satellites. Uh, we recently had a space art show in Japan uh, we, we're doing an art installation at the Torrance Art Museum here in California, prepping a show at the San Luis Obispo Museum, and then also uh, recently had an exhibit at the Spring Break Art Show here in LA, in which a lot of the artists in this group also participated in. So you can follow us at Super Collider Art and supercolliderart.com. All right. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you so much, Rochelle. So we had originally curated this event as a participatory conversation between artists and audiences at ReFest. Um, so we encourage you to chat in um, wherever you may be watching from, whether it's Facebook or you're watching from HowlRound or the Culture of Watch page. And anytime during the virtual event, um, please uh, chat in any questions, thoughts, input, um, and we'll try to weave your questions and thoughts in throughout the conversation. So. Yeah, without further ado, um, I would love to transition into meeting the incredible group of artists and interdisciplinary practitioners we have on call with us. So we have some representatives from the Super Collider community, as Rochelle mentioned, and we also have um, representatives from the Culture Hub community, uh, whether it's our past resident artists, um, associated artists that we've been developing projects with, or and members of our um, global community. So yeah, why don't we start with um, the Super Collider community. Rochelle, would you like to pass the torch? Designate? <laughs> uh, sure thing. All right. Um, well, Dana Abner, do you want to kick us off just introducing yourself a little bit about your work? And you were definitely part of the, the development of Super Collider. Uh, 
Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm a painter and I also have a background as a researcher and a writer um, and I've done a bit of curation. Um, and I think Super Collider was so important, I think, psychologically for us at a time when, at least personally, I was looking for more to get more out of the art pedagogy that I got from undergrad, my undergrad education. And I felt like I needed an interdisciplinary approach to my practice where the art that I curate or the art that I work with um, does more to speak to people on almost a material level, like food, water, and shelter, right? Like that's what people are thinking about now and even more now because of you know what's happening today. So that was really the launching point for um, my thought process behind it. And Rochelle brought, you know, her, you know, a mass of research and perspective and and energy and enthusiasm and creative know-how to it that really, really brought it together in a beautiful way. So that was sort of, you know, the founding years. Um, and uh, yeah, as we can continue to curate, you know, we're definitely the programming is expanding and it's getting, it's getting virtual maybe right now or, and, but it's gonna go back to IRL soon. And yeah, there's just a lot more exciting things to come there. Um, yeah, and I think from that point of view, I could talk more about, you know, what I find is cool about the relationship between art and science, if we have time for that, um, or we can, I'm just checking on the, on what, what is the time, the time limit? Yeah, so we had a, we have a limited amount of time today, but you know, I'm, we'll, okay. we'll get through it. And I'm, yeah, I'm just excited to get to the conversation part where we get to more fluidity. Great. Okay, uh, good. But, yeah, let's do that. Maybe like one one at a time going back and forth between Culture Hub and Super Collider. So maybe I'll ask um, you, Andrea, um, joining us from Seoul uh, or Korea, somewhere in Korea, um, to introduce yourself and tell us about your practice a little bit. Hello, everybody. It's, a, it's really wonderful to be part of this uh, conversation. So I thank you for planning and organizing it. I'm, yeah, I'm in Korea, I'm in Ansan, where uh, the Seoul Institute of the Arts is located. And I am a professor here at the Seoul Institute of the Arts. And my role uh, is in the performing art department. And I'm also part of the Culture Hub uh, team, uh, taking charge of the European side. So I try to help uh, organize uh, collaborations and exchanges uh, with Europe mainly. And uh, here I teach theater production to young students. And at the same time through Culture Hub, I conduct more um, uh, research type of uh, projects connected to the use of technology and mainly uh, remote uh, performing and uh, yeah, so the internet technologies in performance. So that's my my main focus. And uh, during these uh, latest la last years, I've also had the opportunity to teach art research for design students through um, a collaboration with the University of Amsterdam. Thank you, Andrea. Wow. That sounds great. And I really love your background. That looks incredible. Is that one of your pieces? Actually, I've stolen this it's a, <laughs> from, from the white <laughs> web. is uh, just a photo I, I thought oh, yes. was cool. <laughs> oh, yes. It's, it's very nice. I love it. The World Wide Web, the infinite abyss. <laughs> yes. Um, well, fabulous. All right. Well, let's kick it off to another super collider artist, um, Ellie Jatova. Do you want to tell us a, a little bit about your work in about a minute, two minutes? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ellie Jotiva, uh, or Jotiva in the Bulgarian way. Um, I'm Bulgarian, but I'm based in LA. And I also help uh, run and curate shows for Super Collider. I've known Misha and Lindiana for a really long time. Um, and I guess my creative interests lie in kind of finding alternative ways of seeing, particularly like in collaboration with other than human systems of sentience. My background is in photography and new media, but my practice is now largely driven by technology and data. Um, and I think I started working with scientists uh, during grad school where I was part of the UCLA Art Science Center. And I also worked really closely with Mayank Mehta's neurophysics lab where they study the effects of VR on memory formation. I kind of did a lot of performances out of that research. 
Um, and I guess my current research is more invested in finding parallels between digital and material spaces and linking things like planetary scale surveillance databases with biofeedback data or memory systems of plant intelligence with machine learning algorithms. So in a lot of ways, I think in my practice, I use the data of scientific research in tandem with computer simulations to kind of render new ways of seeing and to construct more ephemeral artifacts that maybe bring us more of fleeting embodied experience of being alive in, our, in these bodies. Thank you, can't wait to learn more. Um, great, why don't we go to Eli Smith. Eli is one of our resident artists uh, for Culture Up LA this year and um, she is working on a piece called Elevator Music, which is a participatory um, exploration where you can find out about more on our website. So here's to you. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction, Scarlett. I'm gonna try and share my screen now. So hopefully that will be successful. All right, um, everybody can see the content, I'm assuming. Um, I am a multidisciplinary artist and activist. I'm originally from New York, and I actually have my bachelor's degree in physics, um, but I got my MFAs in art and technology and uh, scenic design, so a little bit of a, a mix there. Um, and as Scarlett mentioned, I'm a current resident at Culture Hub, Culture Hub LA right now. Um, but my, my practice in art is not so different from my practice in science. Uh, I take an investigative research-based approach to every project that I undertake. And um, I'd say I'm deeply interested in the process of memory formation um, and how that process informs cognition and thereby influences our individual perceptions of our experiences and also informs the decisions that we make, whether they be political or personal. Uh, so I, I guess you could say that my projects in art are also a series of experiments and um, that I'm interested in collisions. When I worked as a physicist, I did um, diagnostics for tertiary neutron um, measurement of that is a product of inertial confinement fusion. And I think that my work in art is, is very similar to that, actually. I'm looking at collisions between people, um, collisions in memory. And uh, I work a lot with affect and allegory. And um, I'd say I'm more interested in the stories that people write about the experience of my work more so than I am um, in the container or the form of the work. So as such, I, I consider the viewer to be sort of my primary collaborator at, at all times. Um, but yeah, thank you for having me. All right, I'm a big fan of collisions. So <laughs> with Super Collider, that's like really the synopsis of what we're about, is creating those creative moments of combining those different categories. So that's, that's great. All right, then we have Isabel Beavers, who's really the bridge between Culture Hub and Super Collider as a current resident. Um, take it away. Cool, hi everyone. Um, my name's Isabel Beavers. And I am a resident artist with Culture Hub LA this year, as well as a Sire ambassador um, with Super Collider, which has been really fun. Um, I am gonna actually not share my screen because uh, to, to, be, to be brief, um, my background is actually natural resource management. So I did my undergraduate degree in natural resources and my time working in ecological field sciences really fuels my uh, spirit of experimentation and inquiry um, and exploration that I feel like has fueled my work over the last few years. Um, and I've slowly moved from kind of existing as a painter to really having a technologically informed practice. And I'm also really interested in questions around the ethics of technology and as, as the ethics of technology intersect with our climate features. Um, so the current project that I've been working on as a resident artist with Culture Hub LA is um, looking at the California mega fires as a case study for thinking about responses and cultural responses to climate change disaster and how media and imagery are sort of implicated in these responses. Um, so I'm, I utilize multimedia installation and am interested in creating and 
embodied experiences for the viewer to kind of become their own explorer or their own um, adventure in a space. And through that experience, um, come away with their own critique or even a deeper understanding of a specific issue and the kind of multiplicity of um, considerations that are are at stake when thinking about ecological issues and especially climate crisis, um, which has been really interesting lately and sort of shifting as we are in a global crisis right now, thinking about how some of these questions and modalities of working cross disciplinarily, which I know we'll talk a little bit more about later, um, feed into the artistic practice and uh, really allow us to solve problems um, when we come together in multidisciplinary groups. So I'm also super excited to be here and uh, culture Hub LA and Super Clutter, two of my like favorite uh, initiatives or kind of communities that I'm part of right now. So um, super excited about this conversation and thanks for having me. Yay. Um, Isabel is also hosting a mini hackathon this weekend um, as part of ReFest and it's a climate chamber, a mini virtual hackathon. You can still join um, and be a part a, of a community of artists and technologists and activists working together to um, address climate change um, through the intersection of art and technology. So I'm really excited about that hackathon and hope that some of the some of those of who you are watching today um, will join us. So great. Um, maybe we can next go to Ayo, who is a um, resident artist at Culture of New York. So we've never actually met in real life, but I've been stalking your work online. So <laughs> good. Hey, um, I'm Ayo Damalo Kusande. Um, I don't think I'm going to share my slides just uh, just for time, uh, but there's some good images there, though. Um, yes, I'm an artist. Um, I'm a technologist. Um, and I'm a professor um, of design and technology. I have, uh, I got an undergrad in painting and philosophy, which obviously, you know, it's a hard life doing that. So I was like, okay, let me get a master's in design and technology. Um, and so I teach now at Overt Parsons, um, I teach design and technology. And I'm in one more semester left to get an anthropology master's. So I've been wrapping a lot of my work into anthropology uh, with the hopes of pushing that into a PhD. Um, my work is, a lot of my work is collaborative, is participatory. Um, it's about Afrofuturism, which I don't call Afrofuturism, I call reclamation um, because uh, Afro, well, we can talk about that later. Um, and yeah, um, my work is about sort of creating spaces for um, for people of color to be represented in the future or represented in the past, sort of um, breaking down time space barriers, um, creating alternate realities using speculative design and speculative design and technology to create a sort of magic that sort of fractures space time. Um, I do a lot of work with techno shamanism, work with um, uh, microorganisms and food and slime and cancer cells, etc. cetera. Um, and I think that's it, yeah. All right, man, techno shamanism. That is definitely something I'm gonna have to take a closer look at. That sounds really interesting. Um, and congrats on powering through all those degrees you've been Definitely multitasking. I know what that's <laughs> that's like. All right, um, let's bring it over to Brittany Ransom, um, who is also in the realm of uh, teaching and then also bringing science art to the forefront. Um, take it away, Britt. Cool. Thanks. Um, thanks, Rochelle. I'll share my screen really briefly, though. I'll just land on kind of one page and and um, talk. So give me just a second. Um, okay. So. Um, I am uh, an associate professor and the associate director for the School of Art at Cal State University Long Beach, um, just outside of LA, a sci uh, an ambassador with um, Super Collider. And I met Rochelle through SciArt, um, which is another New York org um, that's interested in science and art collaborations. Um, my work, I primarily work in digital fabrication space. So 3D printing, laser cutting and CNC. Um, but specifically have been working with scientists and engineers studying um, primarily insect-based systems that 
uh, parallel human ones. So in this particular slide that I'm showing you right now, it's a series that I just finished called Parallel Paths that explores the bark beetles, um, which are a, a common pest across the United States, but specifically aiding in, in wildfire uh, spreading here in Southern California. Um, and so a lot of my work draws on thinking about pest-based systems that we think of as things that are kind of undesirable and thinking about humans as a pest-based system as well. Um, I teach a lot of these types of things in my class and, and focus on um, 3D printing technologies as ways to think through how we might solve some of these crises while also addressing kind of material issues all at the same time. So I will uh, keep my brief, but just kind of give some visuals. Um, and yeah, I've been working in the art and science field for quite a while. I went to Ohio State and got a degree in art and technology and then UIC where I studied um, electronic visualization and also work in um, kinetics and electronics. So yeah, it's great to be here among, among like minds. Thank you so much. Um, let's go to Ashley. Um, Ashley um, did a workshop with Culture Up on slime molds, which is my new obsession. So <laughs> very excited. Take it away. Yeah, it's a, it's a fun thing to kind of fall down the rabbit hole for. Um, Io and I uh, did that workshop together. So that was really an exciting moment to get to know Culture Hub a little more. Um, I'm an interactive artist and a bio artist. I also have a diploma in food science um, and have been spending a lot of time in the past and, and especially thinking about the link between fermented spaces and the biology that exists that can be um, observed and, and gleaned for its wisdom to uh, apply to the way that we conduct ourselves societally. Um, uh, a lot of my work envisions empowered futures for marginalized groups, usually through the lens of cultural futurism or Afrofuturism, um, and uh, explores that through uh, machine learning, network devices, slime mold, um, and uh, also things like data weaving and trying to like really spend a lot of time connecting like the importance of like folk art to uh, technology driven systems um, to try and like bridge that connection and show uh, people how uh, in like in tandem those two experiences are in terms of um, expressing data and expressing technological um, creations. Wow, that sounds really interesting. And I think I saw you worked with GenSpace too. Yeah, yeah. You were growing some of your <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. yeah. GenSpace is another great bio laboratory in, in New York, also close by to Biobat Art Space, which is another science art gallery out there. So yeah. I love that these communities are linking. <laughs> yeah, I had a great opportunity to work with them as a science communicator, and it was just very revealing how much the work of science communication is in is linked to artistic storytelling. Those two worlds are basically a mirror to me. Um, so it was, a, they're just a lovely community. So it was great to work with them. Awesome. Oh, we'll dive deeper into that. Okay, so now let's pass it over to Emma, who is exploring the deep seas. <laughs> Indeed. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen quickly. I'm a mixed media installation artist. Um, I got my bachelor's in arts from California State University Channel Islands. And when I was there, I spent a lot of time on these islands outside of, uh, San, uh, outside of Southern, Southern California, the Channel Islands. And there's where I started collaborating with scientists and using their waste, using their research waste to create installations. So let me share the screen really quickly. I think there leaves a lot to think about when you when I say just I work with waste. So I work primarily with fishing nets that uh, a researcher, Michaela Miller, has been collecting as a four year research study on marine debris that washes up on the islands. And it, also in conjunction with her research, I've been using some of the data that Kushner and other scientists are collecting about the kelp forests around the Channel Islands and that overall that entire ecosystem and all of its creatures. And I've been weaving that in the patterns of um, my large scale installations that are very much inspired by the culture and history of the islands. So here are some photos briefly. 
I've also recently become really fascinated in tar as a substance uh, and medium and um, an oil as well. Here's seaweed. So that's the kelp forest I've been making. And I'm also a upcoming grad student at UCLA in the design and media arts department. And yeah, okay, I'm gonna stop the screen now. Thank you so much. I had a chance to see the um, the exhibition at Spring Break Art Show, and it's so great to see some of the artists who presented work there here, and it was a really um, phenomenal experience. Um, let's go to Thomas, who um, we met recently um, at a conference at Cal State Northridge. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Thomas Chan. I'm a assistant professor of psychology at Cal State Northridge. It's known for the earthquake, right? But it's technically LA County and Northwest. Uh, I'm a, actually, I'm a scientist uh, by training. Uh, a lot of my work focuses on men promoting mental and cognitive health and aging adults. So you don't, and using the, the latest technologies to promote that. And I develop augmented reality solutions because it's uh, just not augmented reality solutions, but lately I've been developing augmented reality solutions because it just gets them interacted with the with the holograms, but then also they get to it's still real life. So that's kind of I could share my screen just to show. I think Scar Scarlett tried this as well, but I have a couple of. Do you guys see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yep. Circle. And then this is. I guess this is one of the holograms. It's just like a, a flashing yes. of somebody's life. So you're so you're just able to interact with all, all this uh, those holograms of somebody's life because so many so much of older adults' identity gets wiped away through, they start to identify themselves as, as their disability. You know, they forget the just rich life they live. So one this intervention that we have going uh, promotes this cohesion of somebody's life. So that's just one of the projects we have going. But I, in terms of like art, I think people don't do things if they're not pretty, if they don't are engaging, you know? So we have other things, other projects like promoting walking through augmented reality. So just, it's mostly health-based coming at it from that type of question. And then I try to get grants to get that funded and get the ball rolling. So I, I have my PhD in positive developmental psychology, which is a strengths-based uh, type of psychology. So that's the, I guess that's the, the framework I am working under, you know, like how do we, get people uh, build upon their strengths and what they do naturally to, to move, you know, to do these health behaviors. Thank you so much, Thomas. Um, yeah, I had the pleasure of exploring the flash of life um, and it was a very unique um, extended reality piece. Um, yeah, we were very excited when we met Thomas because um, this year's theme of For Refest is regeneration and looking at that from really all angles, artistic, historic, uh, biological, and all of these different interdisciplinary perspectives. So Thomas working directly with um, intergenerational collaboration, um, we felt was a really um, interesting perspective to bring into Refest. So yeah, I believe we have our last participant. I think we have our, our last two. So let oh, me... Pass, pass this off. First off, I want to say, Thomas, I like your Yuri sign shirt. Um, we at Super Collider, we were working a little bit with Loretta, who founded Yuri's Night, as well as Space for Humanity. So they're they're doing some really great things. Um, and speaking of space, Anastasia, she's been really leading the charge in space architecture and thinking about life on Mars. Thank you so much, Rachel. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, so my name is Anastasia Borsina. I am an artist, architect, and practitioner in space architecture, the Nansen field of uh, helping people thrive in small spaces in outer space, as well as I'm also a founder and CEO of Stellar Mentis, a company with the mission of designing uh, space habitats with lightweight, deployable, and uh, human-centered solutions to support well-being in space. 
I just I'd like to share my screen. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, podcast. Okay. So here we go. Um, so as I said, uh, I found a company last December uh, with the mission of uh, making uh, human-centered design solutions um, for next generation of living in space habitats. Um, and um, we provide a bunch um, of uh, services. We provide consulting and design services uh, for space companies. We collaborate with filmmakers and do outreach activities to promote the NASA field of space architecture. And so uh, just talking about my background, I, I graduated with um, urban design, um, a bachelor in urban design, as well as I'm um, um, from early age, I, I was an, I still an artist, so I've been drawing my whole life. Plus I have a master's degree in space architecture, which is, which is uh, our space degree. So I kind of combined these different perspectives uh, from science and art and I, uh, all, I appreciate both of them in the marriage. And that's that's really, um, that's why it's really exciting to talk to you today. And also, um, so we do Art for Future. Art for Future is the imagining how um, you're gonna live, live in space, uh, not only, um, you know, outer, outer space, but also other planets and um, trying to show how it's gonna be different and what kind of things could be invented. And then, also, we pay attention on the um, public engagement and workshop to, to, to show how uh, you got to live in space. Um, so this is um, a few projects we worked on. Um, this is really different projects. Um, we worked with institutions as well as our space companies, as I said. Um, and basically, this is the art for future. Uh, I, I, <laughs> this is my art. And um, this is one of the examples. I'm, you know, during this uh, lockdown, I, I became really uh, productive in art. And as a, like Rachel, she's painting uh, and drawing her own um, reflections on the current situation. And I think that's really important. So I also try to think of the ways uh, how this current situation can be translated into different realms of living. Um, so also I, I host space architecture talks. Uh, you can find the uh, videos of past talks. We have a variety of speakers uh, talking about, you know, the psychology, uh, psychology of living in space and what kind of things we're gonna give up um, living Earth and then what kind of new things will be discovered once we are there, what kind of societies. So this is kind of uh, these aspects we discuss. So next uh, panel gonna be, um, really soon in like 10 days. So please stay tuned. It's, uh, you can find it on YouTube. Um, so yeah, uh, please uh, feel free to talk, like to reach out. And if you have any questions or suggestions or um, if you want to collaborate with us, thank you so much. All right. Looks great. And I will say I did tune into her last talk and it was really interesting with Frank White who coined the overview effect and um, Ariel who founded the space exploration program at MIT. So she really brings together an amazing community of people. Thank you. Yeah, have we gone through everyone? There's so many am amazing voices that it's like looking at the gallery view as a kind of overview effect. Yeah, well, great, thank you so much. Even um, just hearing a little bit about everyone's practices is so exciting as I'm sure everyone has noticed there's such interesting resonances between all the practices already and um, resonances between approaches to interdisciplinary thinking. It's very, very slime moldy, very rhizomatic. Um, so why don't we transition into the next part of the talk? We have about an hour left um, and really we're gonna dive right into conversations, um, conversation and um, hearing more about everyone's experiences 
uh, working uh, in an art side collaboration. So a question that Richelle and I um, uh, were um, kind of uh, rattling around in our brains is um, share, share an experience. We'd love to hear about an experience that you, where you worked with a scientist or a research institute and how was that experience specifically? And for those of you who are coming from a science background, um, what led you to art? So yeah, anyone can um, you know jump in and we can be organic. Okay, I can start. Um, so uh, as you mentioned before, I combine different perspectives. So I have a scientific um, background as well as artistic. So one of the projects I was very really fortunate to work on is uh, self-assembling space habitat at MIT Media Lab Space Operation Initiative. And uh, Richelle, she actually mentioned um, Ariel Eglo. She was one of our participants in the panel on um, space architecture talks. So I was there as a space architect, um, uh, combining my background from art school, bachelor in urban planning and master's in space architecture, which is basically our, our space degree. And the goal was to complement this space habitat with lightweight uh, deployable human-centered interior elements which actually requires uh, you know, technical knowledge, understanding how things work in space and then you should understand system engineering and research, you should have research oriented mind and artistic point. And this combined plays a crucial role in, in these capabilities of designing as um, efficient as well as um, you know, beautiful um, space habitat. So yeah. This was a great experience. So it's one of the one of the experience. I would say that the general architecture combines two perspectives. Um, architects there, it's are uh, this the are people that combine the art vision and uh, you know science of building things. So, yeah. Thank you so much. And also feel free to anyone can um, please feel free to ask questions, kind of respond to what. Um, other folks are saying. Um, just to recap the question, yeah, we would love to hear about one experience where you worked with a scientist or a research institute and how that experience was, or if you're coming from a science background, what led you to art? I, I did a project with um, uh, NY, NYU um, Langone Orthopedic Center, and um, it, it was really amazing. Um, it was basically about thinking about victims of stroke and how do they, how could they re how could they recover better, right? So we created this jacket that allowed the victims to sort of move their arms in a particular location. The jacket will record that position, send it over to their um, doctor. And one of the greatest challenges with recovery from stroke is that um, most um, stroke victims have to go into the hospital to actually try to get the... Um, um, try to get training to recover. But with the jacket, they're able to do that on, um, online. And on, on top of that, the project was gamified in the sense that there was a screen where you're being asked to, so let's say, row a boat. And by rowing that boat, you are actually making some therapeutic motions. And then on top of that, it gives you feedback as well. Um, so this was a project that we started um, we did several um, prototypes, and it was really interesting to see not only the, the development, but also to see how aesthetics plays into development of um, medical technology, to see how testing plays into that. The devices that they, or, that they had were basically these clunky devices that were metal and plastic. So how do you create a project, uh, how do you create a, a suit that's not metal that's not plastic that has latitude and still functions well um so it was it was really amazing one of the one of my favorite projects that sounds really fascinating and um one thing i think you bring up that's come up a few times is um well one one um where art falls in terms of like science communication, right? But then also a question that I come back to a lot, which is what what can artists and what can art bring to the sciences? I think so often um, 
SciArt is thought about as science communication when really there's this huge feedback of what artistic thinking and artistic practice and what artists work end up bringing to a process, uh, a scientific process. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, which I also experienced recently in a project I've worked on um, at California University at Bakersfield. <coughs> excuse me, I'm just going to take a sip. Um, with two botanists there who have a high resolution commuted tomography machine that um, my, other folks might be familiar with what this is, but it was new to me and it's essentially like an MRI mach machine or 3D x-ray. Um, and we were able to scan uh, seeds and stems and other reproductive organs of chaparral species, which are native species to California and are really critical as part of the ecosystem here and also highly threatened by an increased frequency of fire. Um, and this is great for me because I was able to sort of create some imagery I was really interested in working with, but also for them an, an opportunity to sort of play with their own um, materials and with the um, with the uh, this equipment that they often, they were making a joke, usually are just sort of yelling at grad students how to not mess the equipment up. And so um, we're really happy to just get the opportunity to sort of come in, use the equipment and, and study something without um, a specific goal in sight and really to be exploratory. Um, so I think that's a question that I always come back to is that the feedback between um, like an artistic practitioner and a scientist and what can that look like and how can we reimagine that and that's that's really exciting for me. Um, and I, I hear that resonating through a lot of what everyone has shared, which I really appreciate is is thinking about these relationships in, in new and exciting ways. So on that note, because I'm I recently I've been working a lot these past three years with a botanist to the Channel Islands and the really cool thing about islands is that because they're outlying uh, land masses they have these biological anomalies that are intense and you get desert plants that have evolved over millions of years and you get plants that uh, I realized carry this huge history this human history in them like you can trace a plant and you can see how humans live alongside the history of a plant, which is really fascinating to me. And then second to that, what you were saying, Isabel, which really fascinates me and what I've been thinking about a lot right now is where, where is the divide between art and science and why is there a divide and how can we bring those two interdisciplinary studies together to create something substantial, to create solutions. And um, yeah, I think that's, that's really what I've what a lot of us at the heart of it is, is how can we bring those two mediums together? And uh, it's interesting too, because I have a friend who just completed his doctorates in soundscape ecology, and he became inspired to listen to sounds um, when he was in Costa Rica and he was out in the wild and he was a musician too. So he took his fascination in art and music and then all of a sudden turned it into a science. So for him, it was never separate, his music and his science. They were both one and the same. And so I guess one of the, the inquiries I have is how are fields evolving and changing to adapt art and science as one singular medium, as its own species, instead of being separate? Yeah, that's, I mean, um, it's funny because I have had such similar experiences personally. Uh, for me, that my practice has never really I wouldn't say that it differed or that I um, was led into art. I think I've just had sort of a different uh, focus at different points in my life. But I, I don't know, sometimes I think, and I think Scarlett and I might've had a conversation about this when I first um, became a resident, but sometimes I think scientists are sort of the real artists in a way, um, because I think that both people who identify as artists and as scientists are really driven by a need to understand the world um, to understand themselves, to, to take these observations and then describe them in a language that makes sense. And um, I think that really it's, it's about that language and who has access to that language and um, you know, when and where that language can live. And for me, it, I think it just, I got to a point in my life where I felt that uh, the language of math wasn't really the place where I could be most effective. But I'm, I'm really curious to, to hear what other people think as like a continuation of that question that you're asking, Emma, which is now in a digital age when 
I, I don't know if you, everybody feels this way as well, but I question what, what does it mean to even have a discipline when people are kind of much more autodidacts than they are maybe today than they ever have been. And, um, you know, what tools do people have to sift through information and, and what utility does, does discipline have now as maybe it, it did compared to 50 years ago? Um, I can I can touch on that like a, like a little bit. Um, I uh, was doing some research on artificial intelligence, and I was writing um, an article on a social critique of humanoid robotics. And I felt that I really did need to talk to experts about that. I did need their opinion on it. So I worked with you know AI scientists and researchers, and the reason I needed their help, you know, their their sort of was because there's so many myths out there of, you know, AI taking over, right? And so I think that what the scientists can help us do is debunk those myths that, you know, people commonly have. Um, at least they're not going to take over anytime soon. I mean, the, the researcher I was working with was like, yeah, they have the intelligence of like three-year-olds, which is really impressive from a scientific perspective, but from a commercial perspective, it ain't much. So I think, you know, piggybacking on what arts does for the sciences, I think uh, arts can find a way to communicate you know, these sort of more complex, perhaps science laden jargon and translate it in a more um, tangible way, I think for, you know, every everybody else. Um, on that note, I do have like sort of some paintings, I guess I can, I can screen share real quick, but um, I'm trying to focus on that in my painting practice right now. I'm trying to communicate, you know, climate change, but in a way that's perhaps a little bit um, in my mind, easier to, to digest. So, uh, I think I'm okay. Well, I might not be able to sh share it from my computer. I think I have a systems preference issue, but I can just show you an image through the screen if that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I have a couple works that um, are actually landscape paintings, um, and I'm. A lot of my work right now is going towards a figurative approach to it because I'm interested in taking these references to um, past art historical paintings um, and landscape paintings and sort of the romanticism of nature paintings from you know the early 1900s. Uh, Sidney Lawrence is a big influence um, and applying some sort of perspective to it that will show you know an extinction symbol or something like that, that can take it and add a little bit more of, an, of a perspective on, um, on what I'm working with. I wish I can show you guys better images of it, but, um, but yeah, maybe I'll try and tinker around a little bit. So I have a couple works and that was just like one example. Um, I guess I should, uh, of, I should just uh, say um, from a scientist, oh, sorry, go. Ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I'm just uh, just saying from like a scientist perspective, most scientists are just lame, honestly. They're just so like, they're just so narrow focused. And well, well, I'm a scientist, right? And just talking to a lot of them and most of them are old guards, right? If you think about this, how higher education is set up, it's like these people who have been doing 20 years of work on something very specific. It's hard to get out of that you know, they're experts in something very niche, you know, that like two people, three people maybe read their papers, you know? So I think, and I think that's the, that's what I've encountered a lot, you know, in terms, I've, uh, but I think how to merge the fields or how to see the utility in both, I think it has to do with money and projects. Mm -hmm. Just me personally, uh, it's just like the practical thing, you know, using, uh, leveraging art, you know, to make people move. Like you were saying with the stroke thing, I did something similar at Hopkins when we were uh, promoting neuroplasticity, right? You were, you were saying like during those early parts of a stroke, right? Those are the most critical, get somebody to move. And I helped uh, do the UX and redesign of this dolphin game, you know, to get people to move their, uh, their arms. So I think that's like, that's like the key, you know, it's, it's, there's, there's creativity in science, but it's like, if you're studying for something very niche, it's, 
very difficult, unless it's like public health, you know, promoting public health. So I guess I apologize for scientists, but then I guess there's a new wave of coming, coming I guess. <laughs> I, think, I think in that same vein, I, I, sometimes I wonder if it's just about like facility. I, I know you're talking about uh, funding as well, but um, I was really pleasantly surprised and, and really like fell in love with the community at GenSpace that was comprised largely like I think in advertisement as scientists, but I but when I started, I was very convinced that most of these people were also artists. Um, there are like two or three operating as bio artists outwardly, but uh, there was just like a lot of I think synergy um, between uh, like the kind of practice that I had and some of the other artists and the scientists largely centered around questions. I feel like both those demographics are just really asking a lot of questions. And I think that what's really um, exciting about uh, the um, ability to work with scientists or to like adorn a scientist a scientific practice is that all of your all of my like wild like what ifs that usually um, guide my artistic practice uh, could also be paired with an experiment that could perhaps execute um, a prototype of what that what if would look like. Um, and so I think that that is like, you know, if the, if the facility wasn't there, then maybe those kind of relationships wouldn't have generated. Um, but I, I do think that um, there's just like so many um, guiding purposes behind both fields that maybe it's just a matter of like bringing those two kinds of philosophies together and, and answering some big what ifs. I'll, I'll... Maybe I can ahead, bring Andrea. a little bit of a different perspective no, no. In, in terms of uh, the fact that I was a bit surprised when Scarlett invited me to this uh, uh, conversation because I don't have a background in science. And uh, even though I had an interest in science, I mean, I did in Italy, there are different high schools and that's where I grew up and, and, I, fought, and I was in a, a, a science high, high school. But my uh, studies and my work uh, started in the experimental theater, right? So, but the word experiment often among artists that are also narrow-minded, it just, it's a, it refers to just weird things, right? Whatever is weird is experimental. So, um, and, and then there was this other keyword, which is innovation. And so how do you innovate in the arts? And, and that was uh, the drive uh, starting in, in La Mama Theater uh, that I was pushed towards. And, um, and then later on in my development, I got closer and closer to technology and how that could uh, uh, relate to the performing art and uh, researched uh, on that and experimented uh, in a real sense and researched and experimented in a real sense. And uh, once this process was finished, the cycle returned to my high school where my former professor of science uh, invited me to lead courses within the center museum that he was running with the teachers in high schools and uh, local uh, schools on how to use media and theater methodologies for education of science. So uh, that was yeah, an interesting first experience in that sense. And then later on, as I had my company for a few years in Italy, I was uh, asked to work on uh, projects in which the performing arts help as a vehicle in, uh, um, in for example, in, in, in psychology. And there was a special project that was uh, um, organized by the electric company, National Electric Company, uh, in which they were promoting safety in the workplace with the workers. So we developed a series of workshops in which through the theater we we conducted these uh, uh, workers electricians and people that climb ladders and attach cables uh, on you know how empathically not just with their mind and following rules but how empathic empathically start to feel and connect to the need of safety and so that was uh, 
an experience in a in, in way where uh, art and psychology, you know, converge. And we know of psychodrama. And, and that was another really meaningful experience where I collaborated on a, a special psychodrama event with families uh, from both sides of Israel and Palestine that had victims of, of uh, conflict in their families. And uh, this uh, moment of using the, the theater practice was very, uh, was a revelation and was uh, extremely cathartic and, and healing for, for these families. So these, I think, are examples in which the art serves as a vehicle, as a tool that serves the, you know, uh, promotion and diffusion of scientific uh, needs, but also there is the other uh, reverse side, and you, you all practice that, where where the science can help the art practice. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm not very much connected to art science, but more to uh, qualitative research in anthropology and and how that helps. Uh, collect data that can be used for uh, developing narratives. Yeah. Uh, could I just jump in? Um, because I think you, what you said is pointing directly to a uh, point that I want to make. And I would be remiss not to, not to mention this. Like when one talks about collecting data, when one talks about anthropology, when one talks about science, let's not forget, you know, the, the, uh, uh, that science and the scientific pro um, scientific process is um, is entwined with imperialism. It's entwined with a lot of you know issues that. Uh, so for me, I see I see the combination of art and science as a way to hold science accountable, as a way to sort of question those um, um, epistemologies that science keeps sort of pushing forward as truth, right? Science is not the arbiter of, um, of truth. It's not the arbiter of reality. And I think especially in this, um, in this day and age when we see, let's say, um, design thinking that sort of pushes this um, um, sort of universality of, okay, this is what design is, or when science pushes the idea of, you know, this is reality. Um, and particularly important when we look at technologies and when we look at um, AI, you know, when we look at medical practices. So I think, of course, I love science, you know, I think it's great, but I, I think that for me, the, the beauty of sort of the combination of art and science, especially, you know, speculative um, works, is that questioning of epistemologies, is that um, ability to sort of break away from this sort of progression and maybe find a different reality. And then I, my hope is that, that that questioning sort of falls back into science and then allows science to sort of rethink itself as well. Yeah, I love that you bring that point up and, and talking about epistemology um, in general. And I think that what art is incredible at is holding two things at once, like both being able to be a proponent of something scientific and also critique that structure. And so I think what's really exciting to me and is thinking about art being able to be critical of epistemology and also opening up new epistemologies and, um, and really rethinking how, how various knowledges can impact our concept of what is truth or what is, uh, what is real. Um, and that's something that I mean, maybe someone will argue with me on this, but that science can't always do on its own. Like if, if you're embedded within an empirical way of thinking about a subject, you, you have to follow those rules to make sense in that subject area. Whereas because of how expansive art and the various practices that fall within creative practice are and thought and all of the, the theoretical capacities of that, um, I, yeah, I guess I'm just echoing and completely agreeing with you that that's something really beautiful about the partnership of art and science is the ability to add that critique that, um, that, that I think can help bring more equity to some of those systems that um, have led to uh, really incredible observations and discoveries, but also oppression and other, um, other inequities. Yeah, I would just add that 
um, I think it might accelerate the opportunity for science to be able to look at things from a more diverse perspective. So if science is very slowly taking its time to um, embed the ability for women and people of color to practice at the same kind of funded rate um, as a majority identifying scientists, then art can, artists can act as like an, like, you know, an interjection point where there can be like new modern perspectives in collaboration with, with like identities that have like held that space for a very long time, allowing us to like have some models and moments of diversity where perhaps that's, that field would not have otherwise. And I, I would, I, I'll tag on to that, not only diversity for humanity, right? But also like, look at the world that we're living in now, right? Like we need to sort of re, reconfigure, re sort of re, reconceptualize the notion of the human. And that needs to take into account all types of non-human entities, yeah. I think Great. also adding on <laughs> all of your guys' notes, sorry, Michelle, just super quickly, um, it, about being inclusive in art and science, because I feel like indigenous people have really been left out of the equation completely. And I feel like their knowledge of the natural world in many ways uh, are very, very different and sometimes even surpass uh, scientific knowledge. And I think that artists are sensitive to that at times and they kind of act as a cultural mediator, like listen, like there's different ways of understanding the world. It's not just this way or that way. It's holistic. When you bring art and science together, things become all of a sudden more holistic. So I completely agree with everyone, <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Well, I was just going to chime in. I think what really connects a lot of the artists in this room is that you're bringing that that bridge between the arts and sciences through um, this like system of embodiment. Like many of you are letting people experience firsthand for themselves so they can decide um, what stance they take towards a scientific idea. If it's the factual side, if it's the emotional side, if it's the political side. And that embodiment, I think, is a really important thing that is also left out of, of the ways that we experience science um, firsthand. And another component, too, that seems to be linking a lot of artists in this room is also this process of like scanning, rendering, digitizing the, the world around you to also create these like artifacts that replicate the natural world so that people can also interact with their surroundings in another way. So I just wanted to point out that I'm seeing these kind of connections happening between between the artists in this room. And um, I think that's a really important capability of, of science art to provide this new way of interacting with the world. Yeah, thank you, Rochelle, for sharing that. Because yeah, something that came up in our conversations between Rochelle and myself um, over and over again is what can SciArt, ArtSci do for social change and um, and, you know, ReFest, again, our tagline is a uh, festival bringing together artists, technologists, and activists. So we always kind of see that triad or trifecta as a very powerful kind of interdisciplinary um, framework um, that is mutually enriching, mutually empowering perspective. And this year, especially, we're looking at um, participatory strategies and inter intergenerational um, collaboration as some kind of pathways towards um, that kind of collaboration. But yeah, I'm really curious about um, uh, this question uh, that's already been addressed. All of the questions have already been addressed. So I, I, I think we can uh, say the conversation can continue organically unfolding. Um, but yeah, what can SciArt do for um, social change has been um, on our minds. Big questions. One of my favorite questions. <laughs> I mean, for me, I think a lot of it, um, the way that I kind of approach that question has to do with, with this idea of the ethics of objectivity, which I think like a lot of um, you guys were touching on before we brought up this new question, but you know, if somebody is the object or something is the object, something is the subject. And I think that this idea of trying to pursue knowledge and pursue some level of objectivity is, is both like really inspiring and can be inherently problematic. Um, so I, I think, yeah, like art, art for me is so much a, a subjective language, I think. And a lot of it is like sort of founded on 
um, trying to find commonality through association, but also trying to challenge association uh, that may not be shared through, you know, from individual to individual. And so I think it's to answer that question with a question, but I guess I'm wondering what everybody else kind of thinks about that um, and whether or not like art can kind of bring uh, a more ethical kind of component to the conversation, not even just through subject, but also through language itself. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, sorry, I'm getting a little emotional. Um, during this whole COVID situation, um, just all the deaths, all the stuff that's happening, there are words that can't be spoken, like quite literally cannot have the words, the language to sort of speak about this. But the, there's data about that, right? There's tons of data. Didactically sort of presenting that data, it doesn't do anything. Right. There is this affective aspect of um, the, hum the um, human um, experience to be able to feel. The, um, and I think that, you know, for social justice, um, for. For things that don't have words, but that are universally human, that the, the ability to sort of create that space of magic, you know, and have that be supported by data by the by science right but to be able to shoot that into someone and they feel it i think that's the main um thing i believe that um, science and um and art combined can do for um social causes i cannot agree more with what you're saying in the sense that Inevitably, we know that there is a fuzzy area where science certainties end and there is a mystery. And that's maybe that fuzzy area is where these two disciplines can uh, work together because, uh, and also uh, I think Emma was mentioning about traditional knowledge and, and art connects deeply to that traditional knowledge where the art can uh, help find understanding through experience and through empathy. So that uh, through the arts, we can find, we can, we can have experience of something that uh, science cannot explain. And I, I have this uh, reference of a, a little, book collection of short stories by an artist, I mean, a live writer, Italo Calvino, and maybe you are familiar with it. Some, several years ago, he wrote a, a, this series of stories called Cosmic Comics. And uh, he tells each story based on a scientific uh, uh, theory. And through these uh, very humorous stories, the person can understand how the Big Bang happened or you know, what does it mean to be a molecule spinning around in, in the cosmic uh, dust or how, you, uh, how life moved from uh, the waters into the earth. And, and somehow the, these stories and, and some of these uh, things that uh, are, uh, you know, facts and theories that have been proved through the art become uh, possible to experience it. So. Yeah, I, really, oh, sorry. <laughs> I was gonna. I was just going to add that I I, I totally agree um, with what you're saying, um, and I think that uh, it reminds me of some of the philosophies that are being discussed in the Guild of Future Architects in New York. Um, uh, they're a cultural futurist group, um, and uh, at the moment they're like taking the. Um, age of AI to both mean like the age of artificial intelligence, but also the age of ancestral intelligence. And so as a like member of this group, like I've, I've been able to like watch them explore this with a deep understanding that if we're going to move forward in, an, uh, in a technologically advanced way, it has to be done in tandem with um, storytelling, cultural, like um, relationships that allow us to learn from the past and learn from what has already taken place in order to better construct a more equitable future. But a lot of that 
ancestral intelligence is really held through art, right? Um, the measures of storytelling, the measures of like oral histories, the measures of like depicted histories, um, the measures of like depicted uh, traditions and um, cultural ritual. And so uh, I, I completely agree with you that maybe um, that in this kind of like joint world of creating a better future through art and science, like maybe it does lie in this um, capacity for art to hold our past in a more um, meaningful or em emotive way than, than science can do. Um. Yeah, definitely adding to what everyone is saying, because I'm really intrigued with what everyone is saying right now. And I'd love to add that I think it's really interesting to think about how change happens and when change affects, when you start to change yourself because of a direct effect. And I think right now is, is really like I was saying is, is the, this is the example right now we're living in it. Some people, their life is gonna change more than others and that's just how it is because some people are so incredibly affected and then some people feel the indirect effect. They see the numbers and the data and they're desensitized because of this overload of knowledge. But then, you know, they might encounter an art piece and revisit that feeling and all of a sudden they understand the world in a way that they didn't realize they could understand the world in perhaps. And so I, I really agree with what everyone was saying, especially on re-examining histories and our past and also looking at the histories of other kinds too, of other species and maybe reconsidering our history, looking at the history of other beings, not just ourselves, and not just egocentric, egocentrically. Yeah, it's interesting because I've always found that um, for a lot of people, and I, I think that the current political landscape, especially right now, which is um, what's been going on with the pandemic and the sort of incredibly wide spectrum of what people believe is happening. But I've, I've found that for many people, cognition is sort of held within the kind of embrace of belief. And that it is very hard to move forward uh, with cognitive concepts if there is an inherent conflict in that person's belief system. And I do think that you know, our discipline of art um, really has that potential through a lot of these mechanisms that you all are describing of empathy and experience to really fundamentally uh, you know, converse with the belief part of what is inside a person in order to at, like enable access to the cognitive part. Um, but I, but I also wanted to bring up something because I do think I'm really interested in what people think that we can learn from science outside of, uh, the material itself. I mean, I think that it's so, um, obvious that we can learn literal science, but I, I, I've found a lot of inspiration um, in my practice from the scientific practice. And, and sometimes I find it a little bit of a relief to step into a world where my identity can kind of take a back seat and I can um, feel more of a bomb in dealing with a language that is so universal and so erasing of subjectivity that it allows me to feel a little bit less um, in the spotlight, perhaps. And I'm wondering if anybody else felt the same way or if they felt the opposite way or if they feel both ways like I do. Uh, but it, I thought it was an interesting thing to bring up when we're really talking about two practices um, in two different communities that are really investigating truth and, and committed to observing the world around them. Yeah, just to add to that amazing question, you know, one of the questions that we were discussing before today was, how have you discovered, um, have you discovered that your role or practice shifted or evolved through interdisciplinary collaboration? And have you arrived at or contributed to scientific discoveries, perhaps through an artistic practice or in collaboration? And then in conjunction to that, we just got an interesting question from the um, audience through chat, and I'll read it out loud. Many of us as artists are talking about art and science collaborations, but do we know if scientists are looking at artists as communication partners? So these are just some additional colors to add to um, Eli, uh, what Eli posed. Um, yeah, I'd love to, to comment on that. I mean, uh, I, I know that there's like an enormous amount of science that lives in the metaphor, especially when you're talking about science communication. But I found it to be a huge relief in some ways to be in an ecosystem that was like, okay, so if we do this experiment, this is the outcome and that means this. And if you do that experiment and this is the outcome, this is what it means. And it felt kind of like to like learn through some 
um, I guess when you're working with like bacteria and um, at the, in my head, I'm thinking of like an E. coli specific experiment that had like some resolute outcomes before we could ask the experimental questions. It was kind of like, I don't know, like playing with paint for the first time where you're like, oh, if I mix these two primary colors together, this is the color that I get. And it's kind of like fun to build that foundation and recognize that some things are true. And then once you understand what's true, you can kind of begin to like let your mind wander but it's really fun to discover those truths. It's like being in kindergarten for the first time and everyone's mixing the same two colors together and we're all getting the same secondary color. Like, I, I don't know, it was, really, it was really novel in that way for me. I can address the question in the chat. Um, I'm actually married to a material scientist. My brother is a solid state uh, physicist and I still have ties to the community, but um, what I think a lot of people don't know is that there are grants in almost every major university that can be given as teaching grants to um, both PhD students and faculty members or specific departments if they welcome in community members and allow them to intern. Uh, this can be high school students, it can be you know, an undergrad in, in another department, a community college member, and it can be an artist. So if you do have an interest in working with a scientist, yes, there are uh, a lot of grants that do motivate them to welcome you in as a respectful partner. <laughs> so, um, a good place to start is actually to look at universities um, in the areas that you are interested in, check out the departments and just email the department heads, but particularly the PhD students and the research students are very happy most of the time to talk about their work with someone. Um, so yeah, I would say go for it. Those opportunities are there. You just have to do a little bit of digging. I'll, I'll jump in and sort of answer that question in a more, um, in, in, in a different way. Um, I think that there is um, scientists that know the value of diversity, diversity of thought, et cetera, et cetera, welcome and should welcome artists. And the ones that do, um, you know, it, and collaborate with artists, I think it serves both the artist and the scientist well. Um, it's hard to collaborate. I do a lot of, all my work is basically collaborative. And sometimes, you know, you just want to rip your hair, hair out because you're speaking one language, they're speaking another language and you just cannot get to the, to the center of it. And I think that um, for me, uh, what I've learned with working with scientists or, or um, working as, collabor as a collaborator is that, it's worth it to make that effort. It's worth it to go through that because the, it's so much better when it's collaboration, when it's part participatory. Um, I always talk about the idea that uh, when I first started working, um, I would think of an idea and I'll sort of make it myself. And now what I do is I, I'm like, okay, I've had enough of manifesting my own ideas. Let me work with others and then collectively we'll come up with something and then, and it gives a, it gives voice um, to, it gives a truer voice than if it's just my own sort of machinations. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think that the the most successful efficient companies and entities that have ever been created it's a multidisciplinary um, entities. So you have different perspectives, designers, uh, uh, programmers, for example, scientists, different backgrounds. So. And then together we can come up with uh, amazing uh, achievements. Like for example, at NASA, there are uh, you know tremendously diver uh, diverse um, diversity of backgrounds. And uh, even at you know in aerospace uh, companies, they even there, even though it sounds really technical, uh, they acknowledge that they also need designers and artists to come up with new ideas and kind of you know look from the kind of overview perspective and see uh, how things are working and then how, uh, you know, artists can bring a different perspective. So I, I more than agree with you. Yeah, I want to share an experience about that. Um, I last year got to take part in the Stroke of the New Normal program, which is less of a residency, but more like a post-grad speculative think tank um, situation in Russia. Um, and it, kind of funny, it's called the new normal and now it's like everywhere, right? Cause we are in the new normal. Um, 
but there's it was really interesting to have to sort of like collaborate and think through ideas with people from different backgrounds like there was 30 or so researchers not just from different yeah countries. i heard of new normal i'm actually i'm from russia so i pretty much so it's uh i guess it's a trail cars uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah this is uh you know, um, many schools, they really also acknowledge that you need to have a multidisciplinary a team of uh, designers, architects, and uh, scientists, uh, as well as so if you think about SciArc, it's a LA-based uh, school, there's one of the examples. They have, uh, you know, extremely different backgrounds, and mostly they consider architecture more like an art rather than engineering. So you, you're basically learning how to work with composition instead of um, try to think of engineering, um, like uh, how to build this building, because they also understand that um, you, as a established architect, you will work with engineers, and then you don't need to, you know, uh, kind of uh, work out on that. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it can be a very frustrating process, but it's also so fruitful. It, it can generate a lot of ideas when you have multiple minds putting their, like, different expertise on the same, answering the same question, not even really solving the pro a problem, but more so like expanding a new imaginary, I guess, with from different perspectives. Um, I've also like taught a couple of summer sessions at the ArtSci um, Summer Institute where high school students take part in this sort of approach. And we're prepping the new one right now and we're kind of trying to think through STEAM as, a, as, as, as not the traditional way of thinking of STEAM, but rather like science, technology, ecology, art, and mindfulness. So this idea of uh, expanding beyond traditional boundaries is, I think, maybe the future of education as well. There's another question from chat. Um, are any of the panelists familiar with the gold matrix, Rich Gold, which proposes relationship between art, science, engineering, and design? Um, does it resonate in this context? Cool. So interesting thing i'm definitely going to be looking at the wikipedia page for that um uh the gold matrix tonight the gold um, matrix I, I don't know what this um yeah so we have a little less than 10 minutes left richelle do you have any last questions that you wanted to throw into the mix so that everyone can oh my begonia is falling apart um that everyone can kind of uh respond to really quickly before we close out today absolutely I, I suppose something that comes to mind in this conversation is also this idea of facility. So um, yes, it can be tricky to work with a science artist or a scientist as an artist and how do you start to build those relationships? And I think there is this need as Culture Hub and Super Collider are finding where we have to create those collaborations and those collisions and house them somewhere. And so what I'm really interested in learning from all of you is, um, where have you found the facilities for this? And maybe it's describing your experience at a residency or um, yeah, or did you just go straight up to a scientist and say, hey, I wanna work with you? Uh, what What is that process like? I can jump in and answer. I'll start the answer on that one. Um, I've done a lot of different residencies and I, I'm sure a few of us, like I know Rochelle and I recently um, have done the Arctic Circle residency, but I think um, in answering to the question about working with scientists and um, where to kind of begin, I think looking at municipal resources is a really good opportunity too in your own city. So most recently I worked at LACI, which is stands for the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator which is a municipally run space, or it's funded by the LA Department of Water and Power, um, but they have an advanced prototyping center where there are essentially engineers and um, startup companies working on clean tech initiatives for the city of Los Angeles. And they invite three artists a year to work alongside those engineers and partners in that space to, to supplement their own practice in terms of access to tools um, but also work in collaboration with those engineers and scientists as well. And so that for me was like a really beneficial kind of mutual use of like being able to use these really advanced tools, but also being able to access a community of people that are working towards a common goal of, of thinking about how we can improve our own city. Um, and I think there, that's happening in a lot of other cities, but I think municipal resources is something that I'm finding to be um, a space that I've maybe not accessed in the past, but have started to become really interested in the future as things like 
libraries and other public spaces start um, investing in kind of maker, artists, engineering culture. I'm just going to I'm going to jump in. Um, oh, my phone is ringing. No, sorry, phone phone call. <laughs> um, I'm going to jump in and talk about um, the about access and about um, in in my field, <laughs> design technology. There aren't that many people of color in in that field. I know also in the sciences there aren't you know relatively right. And part of that is sort of thinking about how do we create that access or what, what can we do to create that access? And it's not only access in terms of, okay, um, working with scientists and in institutions, right? But it's also how do you create the access to even have the language to, to be able to write those forms, uh, uh, apply for those residencies and things like that. So for me, I think it's, it's I'm, I've been looking at sort of thinking about this idea of um, new territories, sort of like old geographies of the um, of, of physical space and new territories of the virtual space. And thinking maybe those are spaces that are not, that have not been sort of um, colonized and fully yet. And perhaps using these virtual spaces could be a way to gain access, could be a way to teach so that others may have access to those spaces in the physical territories. Yeah, I think that that's such an important um, thing to think about and consider, especially as we're like sort of distant and socially isolated and what where where that will be in the future, you know, um, but having these these spaces that are accessible for anyone. I, I don't know. This is something I was thinking about sort of posing as a question. Maybe we can keep in touch and keep talking about it but um yeah how do we how do we na navigate that in a digital um world i know I've, I've been part of like hackathons and there's sort of these grassroots like discord channels where people are connected with each other um but what are some other ways that these these bridges can happen without an institution um and yeah grassroots yes we have oh go ahead i was just going to quickly say like in in some ways i feel like it might even be easier maybe this is my optimism playing a part in this response but in some ways i feel like it might even be easier to create these connections when we are in isolation than when we are not in isolation only because in isolation we lose sense of like what the perhaps what the like prestige of a of a facility is or the prestige of an institution is because none of us can access these spaces anyways so like in in a little bit in, in a small sense it kind of like flattens the hierarchy so like in a regular normal world if i'm an artist collaborating outside of an institution with other artists who are like you know, not affiliated to big schools, not affiliated to big um, to big like funder funders, you, you can often feel less important dwarfed by these places that have like, you know, funded residencies and like full suite maker spaces. But when we're all in isolation, it, it kind of like flattens the whole thing, right? Like nobody's in these like fancy spaces. So, so it's like, I don't know, in some ways I'm seeing there, there's an opportunity to like create more, um, uh, to, to like decentralize the like institution and decentralize the like major funders in, in a way that allows us to feel like we're perhaps on like a flatter plane and, and that other, other artists irrelevant to their affiliations have like credible things to say and think and collaborate on and, and, and such of that manner. So I'm just like sort of seeing hints of that um, as we get deeper into the quarantine. Yeah, we're almost at, we're at time. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, like Rochelle said, Culture Hub and Super Collider are examples of communities that really seek to um, foster access and also the space where um, these interdisciplinary conversations can happen. Um, yeah, we're very, Culture Hub is very invested in partnerships that kind of create opportunities for new, um, new forms, new conversations, increased that fuel artist mobility and access. Um, so yeah, it's going to be an interesting um, continued um, exploration as we uh, adapt to the pandemic. And um, I hope that you all watching stay tuned about um, 
what our organizations are up to and also what the artists who have participated, artists and scientists who have participated today are up to. Um, yeah, it was a really incredible thought provoking conversation and I wish we could just continue into the night over dinner and go into, you know, 2 a.m. But what is time now? No one knows. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Rochelle, do you have anything else to add? Um, I guess just my, my closing remark um, would be that so much of this conversation is about access. And I really have discovered by, or by being an artist myself, but then also with Super Collider, is a lot of the power of these collaborations happen when you ask. And so just for all of us to keep knocking on those doors, and now if we're virtual, have those phone calls and conversations with scientists, engineers, it's those conversations that let this happen. Um, and then I'm also reading Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, a classic ecological book. But something that comes up is that the health of a garden or an ecosystem or a coral reef really thrives because of its biodiversity. And I think this is also true in our capabilities as tackling some of these environmental and social challenges. It, is, it requires the diversity of us all. And so um, I just want to, you know, encourage all of us to keep working together. And for everyone tuning in, please do reach out to artists. If you're a scientist, call us up and we're gonna continue our efforts as Culture Hub and Super Collider to bring those uh, collaborations together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice Thank to you. meet everyone. To be continued, you. everyone. To be continued. <laughs> you should make a shared Google Doc so we could all have our contact info. Yeah, for sure. Okay. <laughs> we'll, um, we'll, we'll set that up. We'll, we'll do a series. This will be a whole talk series for <laughs> years to come. Definitely. Bye. Bye. All right. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Good night. <laughs>